welcome by, back, guys. And we saw a very enthralling derby with lots of fighting, lots of emotion, lots of atmosphere, and lots of dancing. And to <laughs> analyze this game, we brought in Taps, our friend of the show, resident Real Madrid supporter. Taps, how do you see this? Real Madrid, six games, six wins in La Liga, nine wins in all competitions. Is there anyone who can stop them? Uh, definitely. I think we can be stopped. And I think the team that's going to stop us is Barcelona, like I was laughing about before before we started the pod. But I do think it's been a very good start from the team. And um, although we haven't had many good first half performances, uh, today probably was our best first half performance of the season. But I like how the team basically just fights until the end. We're seeing yeah. more of what we saw in the second half of last season. Yeah, and it's funny you say that because in the first, 20 years odd minutes it was mostly Atletico Madrid creating that pressure having that like they had more of the chances but after the goal which I believe was the first shot on target because I was thinking I hadn't seen Oblak all game (laughs) and then the first chance boom goal and Real Madrid never looked back in that first half yeah after the goal it goal just went in the momentum swung we basically dominated the rest of the first half but in, in Atleti's defense, they did actually wake up again in the second, maybe halfway through the second half. They gave us a bit of a fight after the goal went in as well. And then the final, you know, five minutes or so, we were now just time wasting and trying to kill the game now. Yeah. And what's changed from last season? Because if you told me Real Madrid were going to a crucial game of the season without Benzema, I'm almost certain that they'll either drop points or lose. But with this season, it seems like they've grown as a team and they're not so reliant on Benzema being Superman up top and Couture being Superman at the back. Because even in this game, Couture made a somewhat error for the, for the goal that Atleti scored, but Madrid still got the job done. I think for me, I would say it, the biggest difference has been Carlo trusting the squad a lot more. And that's something that he started doing towards the end of last season. Because although Benzema is still our key player and everything goes through Benzema, it was important for the team to be able to basically prepare for life without Benzema in these scenarios, which is something that early on last season we weren't really used to. We saw Jovic give a good performance here and there, but most of the other time it would be ghost performances. Uh, we tried out the Hazard at False Nine experiment. That hasn't really worked out so far. He had a good game in the number 10 role. But I think going forward... Uh, basically playing Vinny and Rodrigo as a two is going to be the answer to every time that we don't have Benzema. Yeah, and and I'm going to be interested to see what happens when Benzema comes back because before it was either Valverde or Rodrigo playing. And now that we've seen both of them together and Valverde in the last couple of weeks has been absolutely brilliant. I believe he scored three goals in his last three games. The spectacular goal last week against Mallorca. (laughs) He's taking back all his XG from last year. (laughs) from last year. (laughs) Where he kept on in the bar. But how is Carlo going to pick who's going to start between both of them? Because Vinicius, um, not Vinicius, Rodrigo has been, Vinicius has been awesome as well, but Rodrigo has been like very good as well. So who does it start? I think Rodrigo is the one who gets sacrificed. I think Rodrigo goes to the bench and stays as an impact sub. Uh, for the majority of the games, I would say. And then other games, it'll be where Rodrigo starts on the wing and then it'll be Vinny, Benzema, Rodrigo. And then one of the midfielders will drop for Valverde. Yeah, and what's the difference in Valverde's game that you've seen this season compared to last season? Because his explosion is definite. Like, you can tell, like, he's becoming more and more an important fixture of this team. Yeah. This season, I'm not... I can't really put my finger on what necessarily has changed. Besides the actual, like we're having the goals are going in now a lot more. But I think the freedom he's had on that right side, just basically being a two-way player, Mm. he's just started arriving late into the box. And he's also got his signature, like cross across the box, where he found Vinny in the Champions League final uh, against, was it against Celta? Uh, last week or against Mallorca where he did the same thing oh yeah I I think he basically whenever he bombs forward and there's also Rodrigo there it just makes it hard for the the right back to contain everyone on that side because he 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 basically doesn't operate like a traditional midfielder in the sense in the game and I believe that's what led to a goal or a goal today like just him going forward and 
being so difficult to stop as well. Uh, and another midfielder I'd like to talk about is Charmaine. He came in for 80 million and boy, does he look a player. Like his pass <laughs> for, Rodri for Rodrigo in the first goal is super delicious. Yeah, Charmaine has been really good. And I like that he's adapted really quickly. I still, I'm still, well, I'm still not happy that we let go of Casemiro because I wanted Casemiro to stay. So we could have still had that depth. But I guess uh, it's been a good decision in the sense that Chouamini has had to adapt uh, just by being thrown in the deep end. Kind of like what happened to Vinicius when yeah. Hazard got injured and then Vinicius just got thrown in the deep end and you either just have to sink or swim. Yeah, and the, the interesting thing about him is when I see him play, he reminds me of more of like a Pogba. But, and he's playing more as an advanced sort of midfielder while Tony Cross is playing the more... I, won't, I don't want to call it defensive midfield place, but it's like the deeper. Yeah, Tony, Tony basically sits deeper. Yeah, he yeah. sits a little deeper. But I think it basically it's just done to complement Tromini because in the end, I think, uh, because Tromini even mentioned himself before the season started that he's not really uh, a defensive midfielder, even though that's part of his game. So I think being able to have Cruz there just to basically help him, or if we play a double pivot of Tromini and Kamavinga, it was sort of like a way to just balance that so that Chouameni doesn't have the sole responsibility the way we would have done with Casemiro. Yeah, and what's the difference between the last time Carlo tried this experiment? Because in 2015, we all remember when Xabi Alonso left and everyone was like, oh yeah, but Cruz can play a deep role. And that didn't work out towards the end of the season. Do you worry that something like this could happen or is the evidence there that this is going to be a solid team right until we the end of the season, barring any potential injuries from the World Cup. No, I think I think the profile of midfield is the big difference here. So I wouldn't play Cruz and Modric as a two. I would always play Cruz plus one. So either play Cruz with Fede or Cruz with Tromini or Cruz with Kamavinga and vice versa. If you're going to go double pivot Tromini and Kamavinga, I would never pair Cruz and Modric together. As the, the two essentially, I just because you just basically need someone to be able to compensate for um, the physicality that Cruz lacks, and and it's not really something that he needs in his game. But of course, against some counterattacking teams and that sort of thing, that's where it sort of exposes him a little more than yeah. when we dominate possession. Yeah, and that, that's something I I like to comment on Real Madrid's game because the one thing, and even to some extent Barca as well, the one thing that I looked at going into this fixture, even watching this game, was the fact that Real Madrid are physically superior to Atletico Madrid. And that's not something that you would have thought of eight years ago when Cholo won the league and was going to the Champions League and he had better success against Real Madrid. But now it's like, it seems like this team is physically superior to Atletico Madrid. They can physically impose themselves on the game. Yeah, I think that's that's another thing that we've added to the game that this team can play a lot of different ways. We're not really easily exposed the way we were before. That's why even going into the season, even though like I, I still think uh, Barcelona will give us a run for our money for the title challenge, I still think a lot of people sort of, because we didn't make like a lot of signings and that kind of thing, people sort of underrated the strength and depth that this team was able to add. Because like I was saying, we never, we, we don't really dominate teams throughout the 19 minutes but we basically just kill you off in like a good 15 20 minute spell if you let us take the lead in the game yeah yeah and we have to talk about the dancing controversy uh what do you make of it like uh just the idea of like players whether they dance in an opposition in the rivals field is that a form of provocation I think Oscar can go first, and then I'll Oscar, yeah. I'll, I'll Oscar. rant after. This. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dancing is self-expression in and of itself, right? So I don't see anything wrong with having a dance when we celebrate. Even to an extent, provoking a crowd that has been doing your game, for instance, is okay in some instances to me. Yeah. But just... All of Vinny's celebrations this is none of them have been harmful in any way. And none of them have had the intent to piss anyone off, except maybe the one today, which I agree with fully. But yeah, I don't see a problem with celebrations or like being flamboyant or anything or dancing. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I've got the exact same position as Oscar. 
celebrating, taunting, it's all part of the game. And again, it's a shame that another good weekend of Spanish football, <laughs> we're having to talk about this needless controversy. And I don't know if anything's ever going to be done because the league just seems to always turn a blind eye. I think the league leaves, um, what's it called? It leaves the clubs to deal with like their own ultra mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. And at this moment in time, Atleti just aren't going to turn a blind eye. They're going to constantly turn a blind eye to their ultras. But yeah, going back to the whole dancing, it's all part of expression. It's a sport. It's entertainment. Like even if you provoke your opponent, as long as you're not being like disrespectful, like he's not doing a celebration that's like, um, I'm trying to think of a recent, remember during the World Cup when there was that, the whole, was it Jordan Shakiri? Yeah, Shakiri. Yeah. 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 That's, that's like that. when a celebration crosses the line. Yeah, when you do something that's like intentionally, you know, crossing the line, provoking someone. The same with like audience members doing Nazi salutes and all sorts of things. Yeah. That's when it's provocation. But when it's mm -hmm. just you dancing and enjoying and part of the sport, it's just part of the entertainment. It yeah. should never yeah. be a discussion. Exactly. Yeah, as long like... as you dance well too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but it seems like celebrations has been like a theme with Atleti so far this season. Because six games into the season, we've had two celebration controversies. The one with Jared Moreno at the start of the season, where like he does something where he's just doing it to his like yeah. daughter. And it's like and the casting fans. through his head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but but I, I agree with you like I, I think they're like dancing is the least of the issues like I, I can I, if it's dancing you can boo him you can shout don't throw anything that's stupid yeah. and again but, we know why this happened because like we laughed about uh was it on Friday when we were talking about the match yeah I don't think people are really angry at the dancing there's, yeah. there's some you know some racist undertones in that Yeah. And that's what actually stokes the fire rather than them being actually angry at the act of him dancing. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, for example, I, I remember Bill did the three derbies or in 2019 when he did the yeah. cut sleeve gesture. I felt <laughs> yeah. that was more insultive than... Yeah, that. and he got he got a ban for that, I think, yeah. Yeah. Deservedly so as well. Or literally the fact that a certain Frenchman <laughs> does take the L... Yeah. <laughs> back throughout 20. I like that is so ins like why was there no opera about that? Like yeah. that's literally laughing in your face. Yeah, there, there are many creations that I've met after that. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, but let's talk about Atleti for a bit because they were also in the game for the first couple of minutes. They did they did okay, but it seems like after the goal, they just there was no response after any of the two goals yeah they like like we said before real madrid scored the basically their first shots like they always do and atleti could not recover from the shock of real madrid scoring twice in the second half they like children's children like went for it and they improved but still you never really felt like they were going to score unless real madrid messed up badly yeah. which courtois kind of did And on, top, on such a draw, Felix, because in this game, he felt to me like he was a passenger, like Atleti were playing with mm -hmm. one man less when he was on the ball, because whenever yeah. he got the ball, he, I, I don't remember a single dribble that he did, or I don't remember him stringing two or three passes. And it felt yeah. to me that Griezmann looked the more dangerous person, the more likely who was going to create something. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, because like these two players, they're quote-unquote similar players but why is it that he struggles so much after the first game of the season while it seems like Griezmann is shining every time he gets the opportunity yeah the inconsistency is a bit confusing for Felix because one day he looks really good and then another day he looks lost in the system and although Simeone is part part to blame of the inconsistencies it's also now down to draw Felix to actually start putting in consistent performances because he can't keep blaming the fact that Atleti is a defensive system on his lack of ability to impact games. Like you're saying, if Griezmann is able to impact games in shorter time frames, Felix should be doing a lot better. Yeah, I agree too. Like, I'm tired of seeing casual people on the internet say, oh, free Felix. Like, is it like... At some point, this is like the same thing with Pogba or De Jong sometimes. Like, 
the player has to take responsibility and decide I need to do better on what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the impression I get of him because there are times when he get, he has the opportunity to score a goal or to provide assists and he himself fails, he himself fails in the dribble. Like he could have, I felt he could have done more. This was possibly his game to really impose himself, but he's still without scoring against Madrid or Barcelona. But with Atleti, where did they go from here? Because they're eight points behind Real Madrid. It doesn't seem like they will compete for this league title this season, given how the standards Madrid and Barca are setting. Is it yeah. a matter about finishing in top four and getting out of your group and seeing where to go in the Champions League? Yeah, I feel for every Atleti fan, most Atleti fans will tell you that they never really thought they could win the league anyway, and game after game and whatnot. But I feel for now, like, just fl- trying to win. I feel like game after game is the actual solution right now. Like, don't think out the title or anything. Like, if you find yourself in a title race, then good. Take the opportunity. But, yeah, they really need to wake up soon because in the Champions League, too, they kind of stuttered last time and yeah. could be in trouble because they faced Jutla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, birds are doing really well. But, but let's let's move on to Villarreal Sevilla because that was the other like high profile game on Sunday or today, and that was an interesting game. I thought Sevilla were really good and Isco was amazing. Yeah, Sevilla were better than in previous weeks, and Isco, like you said, was really good. His assist for Oliver was amazing, like the vision and everything. And Sevilla, while they played well or at least well by the standards of this season, Villarreal's finishing did let them off the hook sometimes. Yeah. True. Villarreal should have actually run away with that a little bit more. But I think at least for Sevilla, it'll be good for their confidence, especially with uh, Carmona coming in. He's been a master stroke for Lopetegui. Mm-hmm. And they just basically need to start stop leaking goals and build from there. Into yeah. The yeah, it's crazy because they conceded and almost actually Madrid to to go back to them have also conceded in every single game <laughs> and Sevilla have conceded in every single game and those two they usually don't concede goals but Taps it's the first time we've had a year throughout the season Sevilla they've been going through this major crisis what do you think about Lopetegui's future do you think in the past week with the results against Espanyol mm-hmm. um, and this results against Villarreal has he done enough to show that he can still turn the situation around I think he's done enough to avoid the immediate sack, but I don't think he's going to maintain the season. I still think that if they go on a bad run after the international break, his job will still be on the line, basically from the period from the international break going into the World Cup. I think they need to drastically turn their form over or else uh, the Manchi is going to sacrifice him. But I have a question for both of you. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, if you feel he's he's eventually going to get sacked to sack him right now given like just say thank you for what you've done because another coach can come in they can train for for after the international break and then after the international break it's like a series of like three to four games three games every week and you need a manager there who's you trust well i think oh you can go ahead okay it's in this I feel the question you should ask besides whether you should sack him or not is whether any other manager can work with Goodell and Reki and Co in defense, for instance. Because <laughs> this manager can go, but that team isn't going to improve until January at the earliest, unless you have like some magic diamonds in the rough like Carmona or Salas have been in the last few weeks. So yeah, I I'd keep him even though at the back of my mind, I know he's not going to last for much long if the team of the season continues. Yeah. Yeah, Oscar put it perfectly. And I think that's the reason why they haven't sacked him is because they know that immediately there's not a guaranteed manager who's going to come in and do better. But also, it's an acceptance from Sevilla that they didn't have a good transfer window. Yeah. So they're not fully just putting the blame on Lopetegui because if they'd had a good transfer window and then he was this bad, he would have been sacked already. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very true. And what about Villarreal, though? It's two games in a row. They've had the chances. 
but they failed to convert it. And this is the same theme that we saw from them last season. Yeah. yeah. Go on, go on, Tips. Yeah, I think I think the the bad finishing is going to hurt them, but I think they've shown that this season they've improved a lot with players coming through like Jackson and Bayena. They've yeah. actually stepped up and they're actually able to now cope without Gerard Moreno as well, which is something they weren't able to do last season. Yeah, sure. And then Jimmy Def coming back from injury definitely helps, although I wonder what he was trying to do with that. <laughs> that was, I, was going, I was going to say, like, yes, he has come back, but in the two games, he's missed the penalty and then this. <laughs> so, yeah, but I agree. Like, Baena, Jackson, De Pino, they really stepped up this season. Chukweze, more so in the conference league, has stepped up too. I feel like these little things make them slightly better in the finishing department than last season. Yeah, it, it does. It does. Uh, but let's move on to Barcelona, who are having no problems finishing off chances. Robert Lewandowski. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I'm going to correct you. In La Liga. <laughs> in La Liga. In La Liga. In La Liga. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the Bayern game. But for now, let's give us a brief mm-hmm. summary of that uh, Elche game. Because it was a weird game. Barca went 3-0. But somehow, Elche are down to nine men before half time. Is it nine or ten? I, mm-hmm. It might as well have been zero men. Because yeah. they... They didn't show up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the red card, just like the red card they got in the Betis game, basically sealed the game if it wasn't sealed already. And I think we should have scored more, but it's what it is. Comfortable trainer win. And I feel like, I saw this someone on Twitter, I feel like the biggest compliment you can give Barca so far is that them winning by a certain margin isn't too much of a surprise anymore. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But they would have needed the goals against Bayern Munich. And yeah. how, how, how do you rate Barca in that first major test against a truly elite opponent? Okay. I'd say we showed enough that we can hold our own against teams like this. And even to an extent, like say this was a boxing match, we'd have scored a healthy amount of points, but regardless of how well we performed or how well we didn't perform, it's a results game. So that's the utterly frustrating part for me. And Pedro has gotten a lot of criticism because he had two glorious chances, but he failed to convert them. Do you think that's fair? I I think it's fair to say he should have scored twice, but you know how people are like, they don't, they like act as if scoring is literally the only thing he's meant to do and then go overboard with their criticism. But to say that Pedri, Lewandowski, or anyone else who had a big chance should have taken it is pretty fair in my opinion. Yeah. But one thing I I would like to comment about Barcelona is that although the improvements were there offensively and it was a much equal game compared to the last three games against Bayern Munich, Mm -hmm. is some of the defending was also quite shocking especially for the second goal where Sané just has the freedom to run through the Barca defense. Yeah, I don't and know like, what's happening. There's yeah. no way. I, in my head, I was like, there's no way Araujo and Kunde would let this happen, and they did. Yeah, it's like, I feel like we were still recovering from the shock of that first goal because Bayern started the first, second half really, really well with Goretzka coming on. And while we were struggling to adapt to that, they hit us again. And that I feel like that's what... Champions League games come down to how well you can adapt to a bad situation. Yeah. And luckily for Barca, Inter Milan are sort of struggling in, in both in the Champions League and domestically in Serie A. And do you have confidence that in both games against Inter Milan, Barca will be able to get it over the line, at least keep that advantage over Inter? I'm pretty confident about that. But the thing is that Given the tough schedule we have in October, you can't look at those two games in isolation. So a lot of things can happen between now and then that will either work in our favor or work against us. But overall, I feel confident that we should at least finish second. Yeah. And Taps, how will you rate Barcelona so far as a rival? I think they've done really well. And at the beginning of the season, I thought that Lewandowski and Kunde were going to be the two key signings for them, even though 
all of the signings have essentially done well. Even Alonso in his uh, cameos has done really well. I think they've shown that they're back. And I think Lewandowski is going to be a key piece because Barca haven't had a striker this clinical since Suarez. So essentially, once you have a player like that on board, even if he's going to have his odd like bad game like we saw against Bayern where he doesn't show up, he's still going to score a whole volume of goals throughout the season and it'll be enough to easily automatically give you a title challenge. That's true. And, it and, seems I, think, like, yeah. and I think like Oscar was saying as well, with regards to the Bayern game, even though they did lose the game, it at least showed that Barcelona can play with the big boys again. They didn't go into that game with the inferiority complex that they had last season. Yeah, that's that's for sure. And Oscar, you're about to say something? Uh, I was going to say that Taps is absolutely spot on there. Yeah. And yeah, the, the, I'm going to say it though, a lot of people were kind, of, were kind of like hiding behind the inferiority complex term. Like, I don't think we should do that anymore given the summer we had and everything. Like, you should judge, while yes, the team has improved, you should judge them a bit harshly for not taking their chances when they should have taken them and made the game a bit different. Yeah, exactly. Especially given how Bayern have fared in the Bundesliga, you'd expect Barcelona to at least compete better, score goals. But I, I think it does bode well for the future of Barcelona that they are performing at this level, both domestically and in Europe. They're showing that they're, they're a strong force again. Mm-hmm. Lewandowski is, looks like he's going to be the top scorer of the Pichichi, unless Panda Bora Iglesias has something to say about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you, you yeah. can't hate on the guy because he scores two goals after he gets called up for the Spanish for the Spanish national team squad. Betis mm-hmm. get the win again, and surprise, surprise, they're like three points behind Real Madrid. Surprisingly, yeah, it's been a really strong start from Betis so far this season. Their only loss has been against Real Madrid, of course, and you cannot begrudge anyone for that at this point. And yeah, Borja has been a big part of it. He has six goals now. And it's not just him. I feel like the Pellegrini in the three years he's been here now has really changed the mindset of this club. And they're looking like a genuinely strong team. Yeah, Betis have really gone from strength to strength. And I think they're no longer... I think they're slightly above that pack. You know, we're always talking about the pack that's always fighting for Europa League. Mm -hmm. I think Betis are slightly trying to push into that top four race now. They're hitting that level where they can actually break away from the, the European spots if they can keep up this form. Yeah, and, and when you look at how things shape up right now, I believe they're 10 points ahead of Sevilla. They are four ahead of, of um, the Arial. So yeah. it seems like at this moment, they do have like that momentum going into the rest of the season if they can keep things up. Or even if they flatter, at least they can compete at the level of, of fighting for the top four. Yeah, I think definitely for them this season, top four in a cup run would be a good season for them. Yeah. I want to touch on Girona for a bit, and I'm going to stick with you, Taps, because uh, a guy who impressed me, or two people from Real Madrid who have impressed me so far from Girona has been Miguel Gutierrez, who was brilliant in this game, and Rennie, surprisingly, showing some of the skills that people compared him to Kaká for. Yeah, I think Rennie has surprised a lot of people as well because... His loan spell at Dortmund went completely awful and understandably because at the time that Dortmund originally brought him in, um, Gio Reyna wasn't a thing. So Reyna was supposed to be that Royce backup and then all of a sudden Reyna popped out of nowhere and Reyna got buried. So it's actually good to see Reyna back in La Liga and especially as a Madrid loanee um, getting comfortable in a team in La Liga. I think he's been doing okay and like uh, Miguel Gutierrez as well. And I think this season, Girona will do, they'll do well enough to, to comfortably stay up, I think. Yeah, that must be annoying for Madrid fans having Girona back up because they always <laughs> play from Madrid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but another team doing super well this, this season is Athletic Club. And what a game we had on Saturday, man. I'm still having... The best game, the, the game of the weekend. Best game of the season, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah I, agreed. I mean, still early, but... Both teams really, really impressed me. Like, and on top of the five goals we had, we had like 
seven or eight disallowed ones. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah, and even was, the goals that went in, all of them were amazing finishes. Yeah, the quality yeah. on all of them, even the disallowed ones, was fantastic. You know, the way Athletic have just changed their approach this season has also made for them being a good watch too. And, and it all starts from Ernesto Valverde, right? Because it's the same group. Athletic, for those who might not know, they're a club who they don't sign players. They recruit from the, from the academy. So the manager makes such a huge difference. And yeah. since Valverde has come in, they played a more offensive style of football. Like they're, I think they're the third team that shoots the most. They have the third highest shots on target in the league. And it just tells, shows how much a difference the manager makes because Marcelino wasn't that same type of manager. And I love that he's getting the best out of the Williams brothers because Iñaki, when he has that opportunity to score, like he takes it with so much confidence. The touch is phenomenal. The finish is amazing. Same thing for his brother, Nico, who scored his first goal last week, gets called up, scores again this week. It's, it's beautiful to see. Yeah, I'm especially happy for Valverde because, again, I was someone who was very vocal <laughs> During his stint at Barcelona, again, because of my hate to Barcelona, of course, my <laughs> Valverde support was a little bit over the top. But I do like the fact that he's he's come back and revived his career, essentially, because, you know, a lot of people look down upon him a little bit after that Barcelona stint. But the fact that he's able to get goals out of this athletic club, team, because especially after last season, when we were all crying that they have to basically dig up a striker from somewhere because none of the forwards were scoring. But now, they have I, I think they've basically just answered it with a different type of football and a high-volume shooting, like you've mentioned. So mm -hmm. now they're just increasing their odds of getting a goal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the thing I've noticed with Athletic is that I don't think maybe Inaki or anyone else is going to like get 15 goals or anything like that. That that would be mad if it happens. But I feel like yeah. everybody, like Sunset, Perrin, Gertz... Especially too. Sunset, dude, from... Mm -hmm deep midfield yeah yeah and at times last season and he played as a striker so it's it's weird to see him playing yeah, as that isn't like he originally i think he's originally a striker and yeah he's originally a number 10 <laughs> <laughs> he can't play anywhere he's a swiss army knife <laughs> but it is that i feel like everyone in the athletic forward line is increasing their goal volume and little by little that will help the team progress because if everyone adds let's say five goals to what they had last season, then we're talking about a completely different team. Yeah. I think yeah. you hit the nail on the head, especially. They're not going to have one scorer who does like mm -hmm. bad numbers. It's going to be everyone putting in like five, five to eight, five to eight, five to eight each, each person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we'll be remiss without talking about Raya because they were also in the game and there were some good individual performances from them. I like to point out Cameo who, he got the assist for the first goal. He's been excellent this season. Yeah. Even without like a high volume number of goals, he's been excellent. So Redimo for Cal showed him how to finish though with that. Yeah. <laughs> what what a finish from Falco. The scourge of athletic club as they call him, or as I call him anyway. Yeah. And for Ryo, we don't see any issues with them. I think they're gonna finish comfortably. They're going to comfortably stay up. Yeah. They'll be like, comfortable. I thought they'd drop off a little bit because of the drama, but I don't think like the outside drama and chaos from their management is affecting the football on the pitch, thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. And, I also and, felt yeah. sorry. I also felt like the way last season was going, the second half, that if they didn't stop it and you know get back on track, that they'd be like Levante were. But thankfully, from a various perspective, that hasn't happened. So I believe they'll be here in the Liga next season. Yeah. And I'll say the one good thing the management has done so far, despite like basically almost mucking it up, is yeah. bringing Rowdy Tomas back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that saga was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Headbutts and whatnot. Headbutts. Like, it's like what goes on in that club, it's, it's insane. But if anyone has a chance, like go watch the game there. You hardly find tickets. You would have to line up physically to get tickets to for their games because they don't sell tickets online in the 21st century. Imagine. A first That's division messed up. Club. <laughs> first division club in Europe don't sell tickets online. That, that's right, by kind of for you. And they still have fans who are like screaming all day. They have lots of traveling fans. So imagine if they had a much better management team. 
yeah. yeah, their fans deserve a lot better. They do, they do. Uh, but let's move on to Ralph Sociedad. And finally, they scored more than one goal twice. <laughs> twice. Sorloth got on the score sheet twice. This is, it's like Groundhog Day. Yeah. Takekubo with two assists in two games. Wow. Yeah, Taps, on, on Kubo, have you been surprised that he's fully come into his own at Real Sociedad? Oh, no, I wasn't surprised. But again, that's my bias <laughs> because I like Kubo as a player. I think he got a lot of stick from people because, again, he does have that little uh, arrogant attitude where I think at Villarreal he would have done a lot better if he'd humbled his ego a little bit and listened to Unai Emery. But I think at least at Real Sociedad, it's going to be it's a good fit for him because he can get in that position where he'll just be able to do his thing and not have uh, the extra pressure of, you know, having to track back and defend and do everything else so he can just develop easily. Yeah. And with Oscar, with Espanol for you, um, how do they, how do you rate the, the, the improvements that they have to make? Because it doesn't seem things have worked well under Diego Martinez so far. They, they've been competitive, but they haven't really been good. Yeah. They, I feel like the whole RDT saga, which we can make a whole pod about, like really, like their, their plan was to sell him and sign three or four more players than they signed. So since that didn't happen and he's gone the cheap, that kind of leaves them a bit short on numbers. So it's like, like quality wise, I don't think they're as good as many other mid table teams. They're competitive for sure, but. Quality wise, I don't think they are just there yet to win more games, as many games as we think a Diego Martinez side should be winning. Yeah. Well, let's move on to a manager actually making a very good impact, and that's Gattuso with Valencia. And honestly, seeing games with Valencia and Mestalla right now, it's actually one of my favorite things to do during the weekend because they have, they're full of goals, they're full of attacking intent, and they showed that against Alta, albeit they were helped by the red card. Yeah, very true. And actually, Valencia has played really well this season. And I think one person I wanted to point out was Castillo. I did not think <laughs> that Castillo would come back and actually have this impact after what happened in, in Milan. Yeah, yeah. But it's funny when Gattuso came in, he was like the type of profile that I want is players who are almost failed, players who With they the need that one last shoulder, chance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he's proven to get that out of the Valencia players because it's a team where, in terms of individuals, they they don't seem that good. But when they play together, it's amazing to see. Yeah. Like like you said, it's a team that's also very young. And I feel it's a team with a pretty high ceiling, depending on how well they can do. Because likes of Castillo, for sure, are a surprise. But then you have youngsters like Nino, like Almeida, you have Guillermoon playing well. You have Yunus Musa really coming to his own this season. Yeah. And all these teams together, plus Gattuso just bringing a football approach compared to the anti-football of Bordelas <laughs> is making Valencia really fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll put it, I like touching Lino, though, because one thing I dislike about this game is that he's always looking to shoot so much. <laughs> and sometimes he takes away a very good opportunity where he can pass because he's trying to get that goal. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but as a as a youngster, like that kind of thing will leave your game. The more you get experience and everything, I'm sure Gattuso would be talking to him about this. And having a striker like Cavani, who obviously wants you to serve him, Cavani would obviously be in his ear a few times, and then he can learn from that. Yeah, and on, and on Cavani, what do you make of the fact that he decided to stay with Valencia rather than go with Uruguay for the international break? Well, he did. That, yeah. that, that, that's, that's a really good sign from a Valencia fan's perspective. Like, it shows commitment, and this guy wants to really make himself ready, like, to come back after the international break and really make himself available for a team. Because a fully fit Cavani with this Valencia team, the ceiling gets even higher. True, true. But let's, let's talk about Taps boy Aspas, who was snubbed by Luis Enrique again. What does Aspas <laughs> actually need to do to get into this Spanish national team? I, I don't think he's ever going to get in the team, unfortunately. But again, I don't think it's anything that he's done. I don't think it's personal. Uh, like I mentioned before, Luis Enrique, I think it's just 
Lucho has his system in his mind and he's going to stick by it. So if you don't fit into that profile of players that he wants, no matter what you do, he's not going to pick you. And that's the one thing I've always said that I, I kind of hate that uh, Luis Enrique does that, but I can understand it. Like I have to respect it as long as it's working, then it's working for him. Like who are we to complain? Yeah. As long as, I feel what Aspas needs to do is come to Barcelona or go to the Premier League. And <laughs> <laughs> the Lucho will take him yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, because one of the reasons he gave is that for Aspas and Celta, they play for him and he yeah. wants players who play as a team. Is that valid enough? I don't really like that reason, to yeah. be honest, because it's kind of like reminding me of the, like, I know this is relevant, but like Messi and Ronaldo fanboys, part of their, theories or whatever is that oh a team plays for this guy and like that is not really true if you're good enough you make the team play it's not the team playing for you yeah aspas yeah. makes celta play take yeah. aspas out of celta and we know what team. would happen it's a completely different team so i don't exactly agree with that line of reasoning yeah. i understand it a little bit but he could have worded it better i felt he meant a different thing to what he said yeah, I have sort of the same feeling as well. Like, if the players are good enough, it's it's never going to hurt your team to have them in the camp. And that's mm-hmm. where I think it's going to hurt Spain because Spain, when their plan A works, they're absolutely magnificent. But when plan A doesn't work, they don't really know where to turn to. Like we've seen during the 2018 World Cup, we saw during the Euros, when, like, when Morata has a bad day or Ferran or Sarabia when the plan isn't going well, they don't really have those game changers off the bench. And I think mm-hmm. that's where having your players like Aspas, players like Panda and everyone, that's mm-hmm. where you could basically just have, you know, an emergency button on the bench. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll say the one criticism about Spain compared to the other, like, favorites, for example, England have Kane, France have Mbappe, and several other players, Brazil have Vinicius, Argentina and Messi, you get the point, is that Spain doesn't really have that, like, differential sort of player true and in some ways aspas is like from what is shown in la liga is he's different from the other strikers they have he has mm-hmm. that unique quality like you can see right now Morata is like he's a streaky player when he's hot it looks like the world's best striker but now now he's not you don't really fancy him i think spain have those players but they don't really uh you know play in a way to give them a platform it's always like a team-based Mm-hmm. Uh, build rather than individuals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So we're moving on to a less glamorous subject. El Sakiko was on Friday. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and that was between Valladolid and Cadiz. The worst game of the weekend. <laughs> the, yeah. But, but you knew Cadiz was going to make it that. They wanted a five minute game and they got it and they won it. Yeah, Cartier. Yeah, Cartier said you are who. Oh God, he's he's had the nightmares to start this season, hasn't he? Because he was it was a fall for the the goal Sevilla scored, and it was clearly a fall for this one. Yeah, at uh, this he, point, just start Messi. Like, <laughs> yeah, very true. He made the same the same mistake that Courtois made, where you commit to a cross and then you don't win the ball. Yeah, yeah, it never ends well. And, and what do you guys think about Cadiz? Like, does this change anything for them, or is this just like? Uh, shot in the whimper, and they will be back to losing goal, losing games, and not con- and not scoring goals. Well, I think that when you're in such a bad run and you suddenly get to pull a win out of nowhere, or like out of an unlikely situation, I feel like it can be a tremendous boost of energy, and we might see a different cadence. It's just that it comes just as you're going to a break. So what will happen to that momentum in the 14 days? Yeah. So yeah, I'd say I'd say they'd largely be the same. They just score more than they did before. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. I think it'll give them a little bit of confidence, but in the long run, it's not really going to impact them much. But we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. I think those two teams are going down either way. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think this year Cadiz finally goes away. <laughs> Goes away. <laughs> yeah, Ruby's under pressure at Al- Almeria though because they kept on losing. They they didn't score goals without Sadiq, and they lost to Mallorca on Saturday. Like, do you feel this is just a temporary blip? Because I feel 
in, in some ways, like Lopetegui, his sporting director has sold him short a bit, losing Sadiq so late into the transfer window. Yeah. We'll see had an impact. I agree. I feel if I thought everyone knew Sadiq was going to leave, so it would have been better if he left earlier and they got, they didn't like me. You, you could say the signings they made, like Bill Alturi and others towards the end of the window, you could call them panic buys essentially. So, yeah, I don't think Ruby should be losing his job because the transfer or sporting director failed to do their job properly. Yeah. But, but I, you can say the opposite for the people at Mallorca because like they look a very solid team. I thought they were going to struggle at the start of the season, but no, they're doing okay. Yeah. Like Mallorca have always, even last season, beside onto their bad run, they've always been pretty solid defensively. Like it takes like maybe a team with just much more quality than them to put them away. But against most teams in the league, they seem to be holding their own and they barely give anything away. And like you said, with their signings, we all know about Marici and Kangin, but I feel like an underrated addition is this defender, Copete, who's really yeah, yeah, slotted really, in the back really line. And the goalkeeper, of course, Rajko <laughs> God knows. They did that up. Manolo. Manolo. <laughs> Manolo and Sergio Rico. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, and grief. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, Manolo Reina was one of the worst goalkeepers I've seen in La Liga in the last few years. <laughs> yeah. I remember last season, Oscar. Oscar was on his case. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this guy's kids so much. People yeah. thought I was a Mallorca fan. <laughs> yeah, but Hetafe, they've, they've had a good window. It's taking them time, but they're starting to get results now. They beat Osuna 2-0 earlier this morning. Yeah, it's Hetafe, yeah, the league's ultimate slow starters. And yeah, like you said, it's been a very good week for them. One of their new signings, Gaston Alvarez, scored today. And I feel like this is like I feel like Getafe will only get better from here because their squad in of itself is good enough to be at least lower mid table. Yeah. Whether people think um Kike Sanchez Flores is the man to re- take them to the next level or not is a completely different issue. But I feel like they're good enough to stay up. Yeah. And with that, let's move on to Seria, where the historic seven sisters were all in action. On Sunday, Taps, we go from good news to bad news for you because we're going to talk about Milan's loss to Napoli. <laughs> and how would you rate like Napoli season so far and this game? I think so far, Napoli has, again, Spalletti has done wonders to overperform expectations, essentially, because they lost, I think it was, what, three or four veteran players in this team. Um, everyone was expecting them to go through a little bit of a transition period, especially myself as well. I thought they were going to be the team that most likely drops out of the top four this year, but so far, so good. Spalletti's done well. I don't know where they unearthed uh, uh, Kvicha from. <laughs> I don't know where they found him. <laughs> yeah. He's been amazing. Their midfielders have done really well. Uh, the defense has been more stable than usual, and I think it'll actually be a very good season for Napoli within a transition year for them. Interesting. And for Milan, they're doing they're doing okay in the Champions League. I do think they'll get out of the group. But in Serie A, it's been up and down a bit. Yeah, Milan have been hot and cold this season, especially the defense. Uh, the defense has not been as good as they were last year. They're letting letting go of like cheap goals, you would say. But I think overall, Milan will be fine throughout the, uh, the majority of the season. I, I used to get out of the Chelsea game. I know Chelsea, they're not exactly what they were when they won Champions League, but... Um, no, I wouldn't say so. I think Milan will take at least three points from one of the Chelsea ties. Nice. Maybe draw the other one, yeah. Yeah, but I guess the good news for Milan is that Inter, they're, like like we alluded to, they're off form in Serie A so far. They lost 3-1 to Udinese. It doesn't look like they're going to be anywhere close to challenging so far. Should I go? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Inter. Inter. <laughs> My bad. I thought Oscar was going to answer. Uh, yeah, Inter have been a shadow of themselves this season. And I think um, I actually don't even know where to put the blame on because it's not like Inzaghi's been putting bad lineups or, um, you know, bad formations, bad tactics. It's, 
it just looks like Inter's just in that slow slump they had towards the end of last season where they were just giving away games that they shouldn't be giving away. And now, if they still aren't showing up in big games and you now start losing those throwing away points, essentially, to like some of the other sides, it's going to be a, a lot more trouble for Inzaghi. But I, th- I think they should be able to turn it around at least in, yeah. the, in the long term. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Dude. Yeah, don't Inter are struggling right now. The squad is still pretty... The squad still has a lot of quality and since Inzaghi is a good manager, I believe in him to turn this around. Yeah. And also, I'm going to have a chance to say I was right when I predicted Benfica was going to be Juventus. I said, Yeah, you, you are right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry for doubting you. Yeah, yeah but, but with Juve, what's, like, uh, what's going wrong with them? Because for me, I, I'll say this team, they remind me of Milan and Inter 10 years ago almost when they were yeah. just on the way down. <laughs> You know who they remind me of? Us last season. <laughs> it's literally the same character arc. We got a really strong team and Benfica. We lost to the strong team and lost to Benfica too. And we're dropping points in the league to everyone and their mother. I think I think it was a very dangerous thing for Allegri to put all his eggs in the Benfica basket. <laughs> essentially. Because he essentially said, okay, we're gonna lose twice to PSG, but we'll beat Benfica. And then I like. I, does he know? Now when you go lose to Benfica, you give Monza their first win in in the city. Yeah, like yeah. I, th- I actually think that this is the time that they sack Allegri. I, I think yeah. yeah, but they're saying they're not going to sack him. So I, I still don't understand. Is is the whole money thing true? Because they keep bringing up the jokes about they don't want to pay him out, but surely at this point the money that you'd have to pay him, I think it's like 9 million or whatever. If you had to pay him 9 million or sacrifice Champions League, I, I know what I'd choose. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> even this season, right? Because the thing is, they can still get back into it. If PSG beats Benfica in both games, they win both games against Haifa. And they go to Lisbon and they beat Benfica, it's possible that they go through. So... Yeah. I, I think I, keeping Allegri is a very dangerous game for you yeah. right now. But, but who do you think replaces him, given there aren't that many truly top, top managers out there? Um, I think if I was Juventus, I would go and poach the sporting manager. Oh, yeah, I, I like I was that. them, yeah. I, I would like poach him. But in the short term, I would bring just anyone, an interim coach. Like, I, I wouldn't, like, bring in a hire and immediately give them a full-time contract. I'd bring in someone in the short term. Um, yeah. Even if it's, you know, one of these other old managers or whatever, the old Italian managers, just anyone. <laughs> anyone Roberto who, Di Matteo. Yeah, because <laughs> at this point, they need results. They need results. They're not in a position to be picky right now. <laughs> yeah. The football and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or maybe Perlo to finish <laughs> what he started. <laughs> oh, well, Pochettino is still available. So. No, I think the, the worry with Poch is that if you commit to Poch, you're now committing to like another long-term manager and then if it doesn't work out you'd also have to pay him like a lot that yeah. i think it would be too early for them to commit to punch yeah and moving on um i want to talk about lazio because they had a very interesting result in the europa league or europe, i think europa league where they lost yeah, europa league. They, they lost to michelin 5-1 <laughs> and i just thought about roma last season where they went to scandinavia and they lost to yeah. Bodo. <laughs> <laughs> that's the same thing i was gonna say this is what bodo <laughs> did to Mourinho. <laughs> sorry he had a, a taste of his own <laughs> so. yeah but it seems like they've they they recovered pretty easily with the 4-0 win against uh Cremonese. yeah I, I think with them again they'll be fine in the league um they might not go too far in the europa league but um they should be in and around five six seven somewhere there in the league comfortably yeah. i think yeah. And should we move on to the Bundesliga, guys? Yes. Yeah, who, who who wants to take the task of analyzing why Bayern are so great in the Champions League, <laughs> but they're average in the Bundesliga? I, I, I don't have a stab at it. Yeah. I feel Bayern's problem, just looking at the stats and going back and watching whether it's a full game or clips, is they're, like, struggling to convert these big chances into goals against lesser teams. 
in the Champions League, the way you play against Barcelona is different from the way you play against teams you're meant you're superior to. And I feel like converting that super that eighty percent or ninety percent superiority into goals is what's ailing them right now. Yeah, I would very much agree, and I think also the fact that Lewandowski left means that teams in the Bundesliga can face Bayern a bit of a different way. They don't have to worry about um, Lewandowski in the box because Lewandowski would always create chances, even if he sat deep. Mm -hmm. So now teams are realizing that, okay, we don't have to necessarily go toe-to-toe with Bayern in order to beat them, like the way that Glad... I think only like Gladbach (laughs) still does that way. Gladbach (laughs) will go toe-to-toe and they'll beat them. Gladbach and Frankfurt at home. Yeah, everyone else now has toned it down a little bit. It's Mm -hmm. like they're paying a lot more respect to Bayern's attack. And it's harder for that dynamic uh, attack to put away chances. Because yeah. I think Lewandowski would be putting away some of the chances yeah. that uh, another team yeah. and them have missed. Yeah. Another thing, if you look at the profile of Manny and everyone else, none of them have that Lewandowski profile where it doesn't matter whether you sit deep or not. With them, if you if you don't if you don't attack Bayern, you're giving Manny, Sani, the rest of them less space to operate in. Or, that space to transition into, which would hurt them because that's a comfortable part of their game. Yeah. Yeah. And all this has given me hope that maybe, maybe this could be the year that Borussia uh, Dortmund. Nah, Miami, not no. Dortmund. Not no. Dortmund. Oh, come on. Not do- anybody else, man. <laughs> come on. Dude. Come on. Union Berlin. Nah. I, nah. Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, not. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I, I um, think I, I, it'll be a good challenge, but I don't think anyone is gonna go the distance necessarily. Uh, if, if, um, my, if my cousin, my cousin is playing for Dortmund, he he can help them with. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter, bro. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Um, the thing is, Dort- Dortmund, right? Given yeah. that they started the season with all of their signings basically being in Jordan available, I feel like they they still there's the still room for Dortmund to get better. Yeah, and but they played against Holland, who was their former big striker, and in the Champions League. And how good was that goal by Holland? Mm. Very good, very good. Oh, amazing. Although, although credit to Dortmund, they had a really good performance against. Yeah, them. I think it should have actually ended in a draw. If I was being honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the cross for Holland's goal was like oh, was like is almost like I didn't think. I'm like I wonder which one is better because boots were so good. And that's the amount of quality it took to beat Dortmund because, like Tap said, they did play really well. Yeah, and Serge, as soon as it's come back, like he's been very good for them. He's very solid for them. And that's why I honestly don't have that much faith that Sevilla will do anything in both games against them. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think the only thing that's going to stop Dortmund is Dortmund themselves. Because I think that's again, the issue now. Yeah, isn't again, it? we'll see cases <laughs> where they give away games that they're in control of. And again, you get that with a young squad. Mm-hmm. And I'm not really sure if there's a manager who can take that element of Dortmund out of them. Because I think we only saw them become really solid um, for maybe like a season and a half under Lucien Favre. Yeah. Everyone else has just had the same Dortmund where they're really good, but they can't control games. And yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah that, and with Royce true. out as well. But the good news is I think Royce is only out for like a month. So Yeah. yeah. Thankfully, it does good. Yeah. yeah. Let's transition to City and let's talk about Holland because he just can't stop scoring. Like he's gonna break a lot of Champions League records that we already have. He already has eleven goals in the Premier League for someone who is meant to struggle. And how how do you stop someone like this? You can't. That's just the problem. You can't. You just have to try and make sure whatever you get on the other end of the pitch. You know, you take it, but then it doesn't help that you face a Man City who don't give you anything or rarely give you anything. So it's a pretty, it's not going to be easy to stop Man City. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone is stopping City in the Prem this year. In the Premier League, think, for sure. Yeah, because I think the fact that Liverpool as well is going through a bit of a rough period, I think they would have been the next team to be consistent. Because I, I know Arsenal are doing really well, and I think Arsenal... Uh, will secure themselves into top four, but I don't mm-hmm. think Arsenal have enough consistency in them as well to to go the distance with City. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah, and I also want to talk about De Bruyne, who's I believe is close to an assist record in the Premier League, but 
in the Champions yeah, League, is that he equaled someone? I'm not too sure what that's. Yeah, go ahead. In the Champions League, is that the winning combination that's going to allow City to finally win it? Mm. To be seen. Mm. Because yeah. the thing is that with the Champions League, you know this all too well. You can throw all you like and have as much quality, but a certain team just needs two chances to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> wearing white. <laughs> uh, wearing I, I, white some, most times. Most times, as they show today. <laughs> Yeah, like, but that's the thing with Champions League football. You can have a bad night, and that bad night is when it's over for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would very much agree. I think in the Champions League, a lot of factors come into play. Yeah, so luck is a big one. Being good, yeah. 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 And 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 you, both of you are right in that, as we saw with Spurs against Sporting, where Sporting scored two goals in the late on, and they they some they win that game, and that's the magic of the Champions League. Mm-hmm. And on Spurs, I I want to talk about Son because like I've been hearing he's been having troubles with Conte. He got dropped, but he came back in. He scored a hat trick. I have a friend who just became a Spurs fan because of him, so he was telling me about oh Sonny's back. Um, how do you, like, what do you see in that relationship between him and Antonio Conte? I, I think it's a bit tricky. Like, I think we'll see, we'll see him do well, like he did last season. But I think because of the way that Conte wants to play, you're going to have these clashes where Sun isn't really the type of winger that Conte would typically want. But at the end of the day, if he can get back on the goals and getting consistency with his partnership with Kane... It'll it'll be a winning combination for for Spurs, but yeah. he's gonna he's gonna be streaky as always. I think that's the thing with Son because he goes through periods where he's either really good or he's really bad. He's not like a a player who's just gonna give you an average performance throughout. Yeah, that, that's true. And Spurs, as Oscar rightly predicted, like we all thought, or most people thought they were gonna run away with it. But in the Champions mm-hmm. League, but like the group is becoming more. No, I, I think that's Conte tax. Conte. <laughs> no, it's Conte's tax plus Spurs tax. Yeah. Conte in European football, and then you combine Spurs. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm so like, the, yeah, that's, I was like, I was like, you know what? That group also has serious Champions League tax in the form of Marseille. <laughs> and Spurs, man, I, 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 I like the only reason Spurs didn't fumble that game because I thought Marseille would give them a good game. I'm like, besides the red card, it's just the fact that Marseille in the Champions League. Marseille just, have won like what? One, one in one in one, 17. One in, yeah. Um, one in 17 or one in 14. Yeah. Like I was looking at the stats and just like in the last group game, in the last group stage, just one win. The one before that, zero wins. This one. Yeah. Zero. The, the big comeback they had to Europe and they couldn't even <laughs> <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't even beat Frankfurt I mean who can't beat Frankfurt <laughs> well, but at, at least anyway in, yeah at least in Ligue 1 but still... <laughs> oh man you guys crack me up at least in Ligue 1 they're still, still, they're still hanging <laughs> Oh, oh man. Uh, anyway, uh, are doing really well in Ligon at least. Yeah, so. they're still hanging on, but Messi is finally my boy. It's showing up in big games now. In, in fact, <laughs> so. you love to see it. You love to get to the game win over his baby brothers in Bappe and Lima. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No more. It's like babysitting time is done. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, Seth, what do you think about that relationship? Because there's been lots of controversy between Mbappe, Messi, Neymar, division in the camp. Like, what do you make of it? Uh, I think there's a lot more, like, fuel to the fire that media adds to it than there is in mm-hmm. reality. But we do know the PSG dressing room does essentially have two camps where it's Mbappe and Hakimi and some of the French-speaking players, and then it's Neymar, Ramos... Uh, Messi and the South Americans in their own little corner and everything, but I think it's not really uh, a case that's actually going to divide the dressing room. It's it's just that usual, you know, like egos, like Mbappe will have moments where he crosses the line, but I think at the end of the day, they're still just going to understand each other and focus for the goal ahead, because they all mm-hmm. essentially want to win the Champions League. They're, yeah. they're not going to waste time 
bickering and beefing over small things. Yeah. yeah. And that reminds me of Real Madrid because I remember when Cristiano Ronaldo first moved in and Mourinho was the coach. There was like a dip, it's almost a split between like the Spanish Real Madrid and the Portuguese speaking Real Madrid. Yeah. And Mourinho, I, I don't think he was able to like fully fracture, like fully get it together until he left. And I feel he was the reason why the dressing room came back together because like they, they all they together. united together. They united against, <laughs> against <laughs> Yeah. But on that, do you think Gautier, do you think he has the managerial skills to unite this dressing room to fight for that one common cause? Yeah, I would think so very much. I think them going with Gaultier and uh, was their sporting director again? Lucas oh, Campos. Oh, Campos? Yeah. Yes. That was a very good decision from PSG because for me, the one thing that this project always lacked was direction. And they always went for the Hollywood signings like, oh, let's be the flashy big club, spend money there rather than actually buying functional players and building an actual team. I think that's the big factor that Gaultier is going to add to this. I yeah. did think that he was going to have some problems a little bit with the egos, but I think the fact that if the results keep coming in and if the, he actually keeps showing his pedigree, the players will start to respect him a little bit more. than Because I thought he was going to face the challenges that Unai Emery faced a little bit. Yeah, and, and the type of profile they, they're bringing in is, you're correct, because they brought in Bettinia, who was very good, but not essentially a superstar at Porto. Carlos Soler mm-hmm. from Valencia, Renato Sanchez, mm-hmm. Fabian Ruiz. Like, these are, like, really solid players. Yeah, not, none of fight. them are flashy signings. They're all just functional, mm-hmm. players, essentially. And they're all, the funny thing is, they're all replacing roles that they had in their academy already from players they lost, <laughs> just, like, letting go from the, yeah. the PSG academy. Uh, that, that's the eternal problem with PSG. They produce so many talented players who play in the Bundesliga, in Liga, some of them in the Premier League. Yeah, rather than there. promoting yeah. your Nkunku's, you're going out and yeah. buying Draxler and all sorts of <laughs> so yeah. things. It's crazy because if you look at the Bundesliga scoring charts, you see like, oh, this guy used to be in PSG Academy. This guy used to be in PSG Academy. And you're like, why isn't he playing for PSG? Yeah, yeah it's, al- it's always been confusing. And I think now, and even though, you know, as a quote-unquote rival to Madrid, a European rival, I think that's the only frustrating thing is I I don't want to see Galtier work out for them because <laughs> it was a really good appointment for them. Yeah. yeah, very good one. And Taps, your boy Messi's finally stepping up this season. He's just stepping up for the World Cup. Is it like oh, I'm just gonna like train high enough so I can be good in November? <laughs> nah, I think I think the one thing from last season where people always criticized Messi. I think it was over the top because even in those games where he wasn't scoring, I think he was still good because yeah. his role in this PSG team isn't necessarily to get the goals. He sort of dropped back into that playmaker role. So I think mm-hmm. the, the criticisms were, they were warranted, but they were a bit overboard as, as people tend to do. Yeah. Same. On Twitter. <laughs> yes, yeah. On Twitter. And I feel that's all we have for you guys this week. Thanks again, Taps, for coming on discussing giving your perspective your silver you insightful me. and oscar thanks again <laughs> no problem no problem and see y'all see y'all soon after the international break or we might have a special episode who knows Sounds adios good. adios